Hi, I'm Keith McCullough and welcome back. We started with uh, our leadoff hitter, Lizanne Saunders, and another uh, strategist who's similar in the sense that he's data dependent, but also market ready, very much aware of what the market's uh, telling him about that data. And I've always appreciated that about Jim. But Jim, you're one of the few people, uh, first of all, welcome. You're, uh, Thank you're, you. You're one of the few people who stayed away from, uh, I don't know, Icarus, you know, flying too close to the sun on these six to 25 rate cuts and it uh, looks like the world's coming your way. Yeah, um, <clears throat> the problem, let me, let me dive right into it. Back about six or seven years ago, Janet Yellen was the Federal Reserve Chairman, and they always talked about the Fed gives guidance, forward guidance. They tell us what they're gonna do, and they used to talk about data dependency. If the data does this or that, we will react this way or that way, and the fancy term they used was reaction function. But then six or seven years ago, she used to say, we got to get away from calendar guidance, that on this date we will do this, or on that date we will do that. But the Fed can't help themselves. <laughs> they keep coming back to it. And that's where Powell's mistake was. We will cut rates at some point this year is calendar guidance. Yes. And at that, po at that point, you know, I had some customers that used to joke to me, you know, Jim, you could save a lot of money by canceling your Bloomberg subscription. He said he's going to raise rate, cut rates. Doesn't matter. You don't need to analyze any of this data. He told us he's going to do it because he gave calendar guidance. And that's where I think he's gotten himself into trouble. And what I've argued was take that statement out of the mix that we will cut rates sometime later this year. Look at the data. There's yep. no reason that they should be cutting if you look at the data. The only reason we're still discussing this is because he gave that calendar guidance and everybody's holding him to his word. Excellent point. Excellent point. Now, if you are data dependent, as I just reviewed with Lizanne, I mean, and you're looking at the last three months, which we call the beginning of a trend, right? You're looking right. at the commodity cycle bottoming, the global industrial cycle bottoming, the PMIs bottoming, and you're seeing oil up 27%, CRB broad index up, 15%, the 10 year yield went from 3.8 to 4.4. You know, everything, and those are three pretty big things. Like, I don't know right. what you do when you have a meeting with the 785 economists at the Fed, but what do they do when they talk about those three things? You know, I, that's a good question. I don't know how they would talk about it because you're right. If you look at all of that in regard to where the, the economy is, you would have to conclude that the level of interest rates that we're at now isn't a problem for the economy. It isn't a problem for the financial markets. Now, where I think that the economists come down is we have our model. And, you know, whenever an economist says we have our model, you know, your defenses should go up immediately. <laughs> and our model says that the neutral funds rate and the neutral funds rate is the level of interest rates that would neither restrain or stimulate the economy is about two and a half percent, 2.6, roughly in that range is where they guess. How do they arrive at that? Uh, they believe that the long run inflation rate is 2%, and then they believe you should stick about 50 or 60 basis points or half a percent on top of that. So they think neutral is 2.6. They see it at five and a quarter to five and a half. They think that they're very restrictive. That's how they resolve it. This, hey, we got to get going with these great cuts. Mm -hmm. The problem is the way that the markets are responding and the way that the economy is responding to this level of rates, it isn't acting like 2.5 is neutral. It's acting like something much higher is neutral because it's not showing any signs of having a problem with this level of interest rates. So maybe the long run inflation rate isn't two, it's three or three and a half. Maybe that premium on top of that, which is what they refer to as our star, isn't a half a percent, but it's three quarters of one percent. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, I'm like at a four percent neutral rate. Now, if you're in equity land, this all sounds like rounding error stuff. But no, this is how the Fed does their equations. This is how the Fed views the world. And if it's really the four percent world that is neutral, all of a sudden, five and a quarter, it might be restrictive. But it's not that restrictive. It's only a couple of rate cuts and you're back at neutral. Is And that's how the market seems to be reacting to everything. So that's what I think they should be talking about. Do we have this 2.5% number right as far as what we think neutral is? Or is it some number higher? Now, last thought I'll give you is Paul's been asked that question. And 
he's been asked, do you guys think, talk about neutral? And he goes, no, no, we don't, we don't talk about that. And I thought Larry Summers put it well last week on Wall Street Week. He said that's like driving by feel without looking at the speedometer. You got to at least have a speedometer that you're trying to to gauge. Now, maybe your speedometer is wrong, but to say, no, I'm not even going to bother with the speedometer, but I know what the speed limit is. Good, good luck with the, good luck telling the cop that after you got pulled over. I don't look at the speedometer. I got I drive by feel is basically what I'm going to do. Yeah, we, we, we go by feel. And actually, just to take that one step further, to use his words, we call this part of the inflation reacceleration a little bumpy. I think he said yes. bumpy instead of transitory. He didn't go there, but he all but said it. You know, the, the yeah. most recent couple months or, you know, that that's it's, it's bumpy. We're eventually going to get I, I mean, he literally said it. I mean, I might as well just read it one more time. He said inflation's moving down gradually on a somewhat bumpy road towards two percent. You know, our inflation now cast guys, if you show them one more time, are three and a quarter percent and rising. Wall Street Bloomberg consensus, which I assume you're not. Uh, part of that consensus, you know, is expecting inflation to go down towards two and a half percent and then towards two. I mean, it's it's going the wrong way. We're going the wrong way. Never mind the speedometer. <laughs> right. No, I agree with you. It, I agree with you. I, I, you know, it, my my view on inflation is more in line with your now cast, you know, around three and a half percent. Wall Street is trapped in this idea that um, you know that the Fed's long-run target is two, and that they will eventually hit the long-run target. Look, Jan Hatzi, it's a Goldman Sachs's chief economist, came out on Friday, and they asked him how many rate cuts are there going to be, you know, this this year, and he said three. And they asked him why, and he said, literally said, because Jay said there's going to be three. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, <laughs> and so that's how economists work. Why yeah. is there going to be three rate cuts? Because Jay said there's going to be three. Why do we keep forecasting the long run rate of inflation too? Because the Fed said that's what their target is. And they need to kind of divorce themselves. Okay, the Fed could say this, and that's fine. But we need to kind of independently assess where things are going. And the independent assessment is it's much stronger and inflation is much higher than what they think. Well, it's, it's an amazing thing to watch. Guys, go to slide 107. I mean, if all your okay, now we got the speedometer. You and I are going to choose mm -hmm. to look at that. We're going to choose right. to look at ways. Like we use ways. We're like really forward looking. For those of you that don't know, Bianco and I are like fractal magicians. Like we look at ways <laughs> when we drive. We don't have a paper map. Like Jay says, he reads the papers in the morning. He quite literally said that two pressers ago, I think. But you know, when you look at ways, there's some pretty big um, there's some pretty big downhills coming, right? I don't know if you can see that. But 110 basis points comes out of the base effect in five months, another 120 in the four months after that. So why, if your now cast is, how would you mathematically, it's mathematically impossible, first of all, to get inflation to decelerate when the base effects are falling and oil's up 27% in a straight line. Like, how, how does that happen? Does that discussion happen at the Fed? Uh, you know, that's a good question because I've been making that exact same point. And by the way, before I go on that, there was uh, some political con uh, political commentators that once said the last place in the planet that still reads ha the newspapers is people in Washington, D.C. Everybody else <laughs> is basically online because they think that what's on the front page and the size of the type still matters. It's the yeah. last place. So I'm not surprised that Jay still reads the newspapers every day. He probably gets he's one of the last guys gets ink on his hands. I, mean, I, could, I couldn't believe he said I, mean, I, I did. I believed it. And then when I thought about it, yeah. I was like. Oh, he does. It, That's what he it's does. It's the only place. It's the only place. They 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 think that the the cover of the Washington Post matters. Everywhere else, we all read it online, and we don't even read the newspapers. We usually read aggregations <laughs> or blogs, is what we wind up reading, or 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 our, our news feed on social media. But if you um, have but, if uh, you have to have one chart, like, uh, let's take a step back. I mean, first of all, how many years have you been doing this? I don't want to date you here. Oh, over thirty. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm like. I'm, I'm almost at the quarter century mark. You take us two, that's over 50 years, obviously. And it took at least two thirds of that of my career f before I started to hear the Fed utter the words base effect, right? right. And they started, because they needed something to blame, right? So, you, oh, it's the base effect, it's the base effect. But when it goes the other way, it's not the base effect. It's, just, it's ridiculous. Uh, but now they know about base effects. You don't have to read papers to look at that slide 107 one more time. Oh, I agree. I agree. And for everybody, a base effect is 
on the year over year calculation, you drop the, you know, the April of 2023 uh, uh, monthly reading and you add in the April of 2024 monthly reading in the year over year calculation. And that April, May, June, July, August numbers from a year ago were really low uh, CPI numbers. And so it's a very easy to put up higher numbers than that and watch the year over year go up. And we've done the same calculations you do. And I could see the year over year CPI hitting 4% this summer just on the base effect. Yep. Now, the Fed will come out and say, but we target for PCE, another measure of inflation, which tends to be a bit lower. But the Fed is also a very political animal. I, I, you know, to be clear about this, I like this. I like the line that Claudia Sam uses. The Fed is not partisan, but they are political. And I believe that, too. What I mean by not partisan, they don't sit around the meeting, the table going, hey, we want Biden or we want Trump, probably Biden to be elected. So what policy do we do to get Biden elected? They don't do that. I agree. No. They don't do that. But they're political. You know, if the base effect causes CPI to go to 4 percent and we cut rates and it keeps going up, they're going to fillet this organization. So we better not cut rates if the base effect is leading higher. The only thing I could see them looking at in the base effect is maybe they believe the price of crude oil is going to crash or maybe they think the price of um, shelter, you know, OER owners equivalent rent is going to crash. I don't see it. I, you know, obviously anything can happen with crude oil. But, you know, if it crashes in the next 30, 60, 90 days, um, that would be something that no one could really predict. Ne and neither could this 795 economists at the Fed. It would just happen. And I don't know how you would predict that or how you would come up with the idea that there's going to be a sudden crash in OER prices. But short of that, I'm with you. I don't know how you see these numbers go down. And considering the Fed's political nature, they can't be declaring victory as these numbers are going up and saying, we're going to be cutting rates. And at some point, I think the markets that I'm talking about, the equity market, the credit markets and stuff are going to wake up to the fact that easy money that you're assuming because Jay told you may not be coming as quickly as you think. This is, it, it's so, um, it's so alarming uh, to see the, the competence. Like let's use uh, our buddy in Chicago, Austin Goolsby. All right. <laughs> now yeah. you wouldn't say what you just said about uh, being a uh, partisan uh, about him. He, he, he had a deep voice, and he, he, uh, it was a Hall of Fame year for inflation. Like, mm -hmm. he talks about the golden rule. I was like, what the, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, the golden rule? <laughs> like, I mean, th you have some serious animals inside of, inside of the Fed House now, in, in political right. animals. Now, that guy's characterization of inflation, you know, might go down. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm certainly not going to wave it off or forget about it, by the way, uh, that we're happy, like the, the American people are experiencing Hall of Fame economic realities on inflation. Are you kidding me? Yeah, no, um, you know, he, I, I'll, I'll make some comments about him and I, I'm going to preface these comments by saying these are public comments that were disclosed in Bloomberg stories several months ago. So this is not inside information. First of all, He's a Ph.D. economist at the University of Chicago. So he's an eminently qualified economist. So let's, you know, let's not forget that. But also, his day job when he was the Council of Economic Advisors for uh, Barack Obama, he is a political spokesman for the Democrat Party. And when his name was first floated to be the Chicago Fed president, the Board of Governors has a veto on any regional Fed president, and they never veto them. But Christopher Waller and Michelle Bowman, two governors, did abstain from voting for him. So that, that was unprecedented, that they didn't even say yes. They just said, we, we're just going to abstain. We're not going to vote uh, on him at all. And I think that it reflected the very political nature of him. And then Add into this, again, this is Bloomberg reporting. I'm just parodying here. You can go Google it. His wife is a managing director at a big, well-known search firm in Chicago that was hired to find the Chicago Fed president, and they picked him. 
his her husband. Now, oh after the fact, when after the fact, when it was disclosed by Bloomberg and they asked the Fed after the fact, they said, no, no, she just she recused herself from the process. Well, I don't know when she recused herself from the process. And did she recuse herself in the beginning because she knew he was going to get the job? Did she recuse himself when others in that organization decided to pick him? I don't know how that is. So um, I'm just reporting what Bloomberg said. So. He's always been, to me, now this is my opinion about him, a very partisan person. So when he talks about Hall of Fame, you know, type of decline of inflation, and it's very good for the American public, you know, is he telling us what he thinks is the best for policy for the country, uh, monetary policy for the country, or is his roots still with his partisanship and he wants the Fed to cut rates because he wants easy policy? going into the election and he's making a partisan opinion about where he wants to go i don't know and no one really presses him on that question you know I, to I, ask him i i, I we pre we pressed him on uh you know, social media and he blocked every single account that we have so i mean he does definitely so there's your there, there's an answer for you <laughs> and and i would i would say that at least given that i didn't know what you just said there's probably at least 80 percent using a very, very conservative number of people that are watching this that 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 uh, knew that. Now, that will inspire many more of the fourth turning thoughts that people have. There's the state, there's the elites, and then there's the rest of us. And the rest right. of us can go pound sand. Right. So mm -hmm. uh, in the meantime, and by the way, inflation, you either believe them, you believe Austin Goolsby that this is a Hall of Fame year and it's disinflation or you're running money and you're long of inflation and you're making money, right? Right. That's the other thing. That's the hardest thing for me, Jim. I'm long inflation out the wazoo. We're long everything from lumber to, you know, I even think of Bitcoin as a commodity, so that's been inflating like crazy. Uh, oil's up 20% in the last three months. Uh, like I said, up 27% since the cycle low. Plenty of things to be long, copper, et cetera, et cetera, energy stocks. These are the leaders, right? So the problem I have with that is that the people with a capital T and a capital P are going to have to eat it. Like, you know, if you, if you get one rate cut, never mind two or three, inflation is going to go up faster. It's not going to go up less. Right. And that's important to note. Yesterday, uh, Bankrate.com put out their yearly analysis that they put out. 44% of the American public cannot come up with $1,000 in an emergency. Wow. They live pay, they live paycheck to paycheck, 44%, <coughs> from 43% last year, according to their number. Um, and they live paycheck to paycheck, and they rent. Now, the people listening to us, you and me, we own homes, we own portfolios, we have positions, we go to the store, we see prices go up, we probably mutter some choice four-letter words under our breath, and we pay it, and we move on. But for those 44%, they have to make decisions. They yep. can't just mutter words and then pay it and move on. They have to buy this and then not buy something else. So if the Fed wants to be a little cavalier about inflation, oh, it's a Hall of Fame, we could cut rates, you know, get kind of the animal spirits going with stocks and the other 56% that own stocks and especially the top 10% that own a lot of stocks, they'll see their home price go up, they'll see their portfolio go up, they'll be fine. If they're wrong, and they re cut rates and it produces too much stimulus and more inflation and those people in the bottom 44 percent fall even further behind look i get a paycheck and that paycheck is fixed i might get a raise in a year and prices are going up now you think that they're unhappy now you know well, that's how you could that's how you by the way that's how i square that circle where people ask me but the economic data as we talked about is good but when you look at people talking about what they think about the economy, they think it's terrible. How do you square those two? Because the upper 50 percent spend 85 percent of in the economy. They're 85 percent of the spending in the economy is the upper 50 percent. And something like 40 percent of the spending is the upper 10 percent. So they're doing all the spending because they've owned portfolios and there's animal spirits going because the Fed talks about cutting rates and stuff. And look, we're in the business of jumping on that trend too, in which we try to jump on that trend and, and make money. But the bottom 44%, they don't have money 
to say, look, we should be long a commodity ETF or we should be long the bit spot Bitcoin ETF. They don't have money to do that. And so they can't even, even if they think it, they can't take advantage of that. And if he's wrong with cutting rates and inflation goes up, one person, one vote. Look, Jeff Bezos probably spends more money than a million people in that 44 percent. But he only gets one vote. Right. And that's why you could see that the a president's approval rating and Trump running competitive with Biden when he didn't four years ago is all because of this unhappiness about inflation. And so that's why it's very important that if they cut rates, it better not spur more inflation. That's why I said they will absolutely fillet that organization if they produce higher inflation. Look, you and me and a lot of other people, our job is to assess that and position for that. At least we have the ability to us, you know, yeah. to <clears throat> take advantage of it. But 44 percent of the country is just at the mercy that he better be right because they're not in the ability to take advantage of it. And that's the everybody else. And that's why this matters a lot that they get this inflation call correct. Yeah. If 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 you if I was in the elites in the state club, which never, ever, never don't want it, never. If they gave me a buzz and said, hey, you know, Keith, I heard you talking to Bianco. Um, here's a little insight. Uh, we're actually, you know, the whole thing that J Jim said about because Jay said he's going to cut three times. We're actually going to cut four, but we're going to do it like we're going to surprise people. I would I'd hang up the phone, first of all, uh, uh, I'd go have a shower. Uh, then I'd, I'd come back <laughs> and, and I would I would buy the living shit out of copper futures, oil futures you know, more energy stocks like this is the most basic relationship. You and I, again, 55 years collectively, our job has basically become front running what the Fed's going to do next. Like nobody mm -hmm. on the buy side would say something to the contrary. It, to, 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 to even whisper the thought that the Fed cutting interest rates is not inflationary just, just reflects that you're probably a, one of the 785 economists in a weenie bin right now reading the Washington Post. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. By the way, you know, elite is a state of mind. It's not a level of income. And, that, and that's, why, <laughs> that's why you want to definitely you want to separate the two. Well, um, you, you know, know. I, I try to tell that to hockey parents. You know, the whole drill in Chicago. They're crazy. You know, yeah. and, and congrats yeah. to the Chicago mission team. That, um, the girls 14U team just won the national championship. Um, but yeah, we, we like to put the parent, hockey parents like to put, well, I play for mission elite. Uh, they play for triple A, you know, they, they play mm -hmm. double A. The elite, mm -hmm. there is a separation of elite hockey player, as you know, with Bedard. But, but uh, yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate the elite yeah. versus the political status. Very good point. Right, right. And, and, that's why, and that's why I think the markets are so obsessed with this. You know, people have asked me, a lot of times people ask me, Boy, we talk about the Fed so much. Why do we obsess over the Fed? Because it kind of matters right now. That's why we obsess about the Fed. You know, they have the ability to stimulate the economy by making, remember, interest rates are the cost of money. If you make money cheaper to borrow, you know, to acquire, um, you know, to borrow money and to pay, you're going to go out and you're going to create economic activity. For most of us, that might mean buy a house because mortgage rates go down. Yep. Or it might be expand a business or buy a business or 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 borrow money to make an investment. And you're going to create more economic activity and that economic activity will create demand. And if you, if inflation is not on its way to two percent, which we talked about, we don't think it is. And you create more economic demand by making money cheaper you're going to create more inflation. What are we going to do with that money? I'm going to borrow money. What am I going to do with it? I'm going to buy something, an investment that buys something. And what are they going to do? They're going to bid up the price of things. And that's going to create inflation. Now, if the, if the inflation rate is on its way to 2% because either there's excess supply in the world or there's, or there's a softening of demand, then making money cheaper won't produce inflation. Is there excess supply in the world? Boy, that's a tough one to argue right now, too, because it's hard to say that with the low unemployment rate, we have, you know, excess supply of unemployed workers. 
Uh, there's maybe an case to be made at the very low end because of all the migrant workers have come in the country. There's an excess supply of minimum wage workers. Okay, but that's minimum wage workers. That's not up and down the spectrum. But the low unemployment rate yeah. suggests no. Is there an excess supply of goods? Well, all the bottlenecks between the Red Sea, the low water level in the Panama Canal, the problems with the Baltimore Harbor and stuff is showing evidence that this movement of things on boats, whether it's copper or crude oil or finished goods in a container, is slowing down because they have to take longer routes. Remember that most of these boats, whether you're talking about a crude oil tanker or a container ship, they just run shuttle back and forth between like a, crude, like a container ship. They just run a shuttle back and forth between Asia and Los Angeles. And they do, you know, or Asia and Europe, which would be a better example. And they do it six times a year, but now they got to go around Africa. They can only go four and a half times a year because they got to go longer. Well, all of a sudden, the volume of stuff, supply that you expect is going to go down because we're not going to have as many frequent trips as we expected. And so, no, don't cut rates into the face of slowing supply because that will just make people bid on the price and cause inflation to go up. This is why it matters. And 44% of the country is not of the opinion like, you know, we'll buy the shit out of copper. We'll buy the shit out of the Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. ETF. They don't have money to do that. That's what I, they I mean. It's bet. like so. Yeah, they, that's they have the, to bet that the Fed gets it right. That is the perverse reality of my job and of yours. Uh, anybody who's open and honest about it is that I'm smart enough to buy inflation and you're not. You don't have you don't have those means. You might be smart mm -hmm. enough. You shouldn't say smart. It's not, not about being smart. You it's don't have the means to buy the inflation. means to do it. Exactly. And having yeah. or even just having the um, you mean, there's a, a, a very obvious divide between and let's get into it. The, the divide between people who ha have money and are earning a very nice risk free rate on and compounding returns on that money and people who have to pay the bills. Now, today's uh, small business NFIB reports came out and it just reiterated that inflation Again, inflation's their number one problem, and so is the cost of money, to your point. So again, what is it, 97% of companies in America are, are small to medium-sized businesses that aren't listed on the New York Stock Exchange? Yeah, that's, yes. You got 44% you got of the people, and you, and of the people, that's, again, that includes everyone who doesn't have any money, um, and, and you have 97% of companies in America. So your neighborhoods, everywhere you go, that everybody knows, right? You don't, you don't, you don't, you can't walk up to Target and see a mother of four walk in on a Saturday morning and say, hey, it's a Hall of Fame year for inflation. Yeah, she's going to whack you in the face. I mean, it's like, are you kidding me? Right. Oh, yeah. And, and I'll go you one step further with that. You know, 97% um, of companies um, are not listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Half the American workforce works for a company of less than 500 employees. Yep. And about a third of the American workforce works for a company of less than 100 employees. I'm going to bet Hedgeye and Bianco Research are less than 100 employees, both of us. You know, so that's not uncommon um, if you, you know, to have uh, to work for a company of less than 100 employees. We're not listed uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. And that's where all the growth is. And I'll give you one more statistic. If you look at companies of over 5,000 employees, big companies, probably listed on the New York Stock Exchange, the number of people that they employ today is roughly the same as the number of people they employed 40 years ago. Yeah. Why? Because, you know, take take General Motors. General Motors makes a car now with one eighth the number of workers that they did 40 years ago. It's all robots. So big companies are usually going into productivity to, you know, either, you know, now today AI or robotics or something so that they can reduce their headcount. So where do most people get their jobs? They most people get their jobs from small companies. Yeah. Is where they, they they that's where all the growth is in the creation of of new small companies. So when the NFIB talks about that inflation, the price of the price, their raw material that they get for their product that they then resell if they're like think a retail store and the price of money because they've got to borrow money um, you know, for their inventories or they got to borrow money um, in order to run their store. That is a big, big deal for them. And to throw in one other little twist on this, they don't have access to the capital markets. They have to take out bank loans. Yes. And after Silicon Valley Bank and after all of the other problems that the banks are having because they're saddled with bad office real estate loans, 
if you look at like the Federal Reserve's SLUs report, which is the uh, Senior Loan Officer Survey, bank loans are much more expensive than going to the bond market and borrowing even in the high yield or investment grade market. Right. But if you're a store with 80 employees, you can't borrow in the corporate bond market. You have to go to the bank to get a loan. Yep. And those that money is a lot more expensive. So, yeah, I understand exactly why the NFIB is saying that. And let's not forget, the NFIB might, IB might not be surveying companies that we invested because they're not listed on the New York Stock Exchange. They're surveying companies that hire people. Yes. And that drives the economy. And so they matter. They matter a lot. Well, the way that this is, a, I'll show you a couple quick charts just to show the, uh, what Jim's saying is empirically correct. So go to slide 80, we show NFIB earnings on the left side, which have completely collapsed, and we've just discussed a bunch of reasons why, and hiring plans fallen as well. Now, the government's answer to that is a third of NFP, or you know, payrolls, are, are, are government, you know, deficit-funded government, government hires at very high average hourly earnings relative to the base of like you said, minimum wage. Um, so mm -hmm. there's that, and then one other, the next one, slide 81, to Jim's point, like the, uh, on the left side we show NFIB, small business, the average interest rate paid on short-term debt. So this is, my, uh, this is my question on this. I mean, look at that chart, Jim. You know that you, it's probably emblazoned in, your, in the back of your, mm -hmm. of your market skull, but the le you would have to cut interest rates, not three times, five times, like we think you'd have to cut interest rates like 15 times to get that thing back in line. Right, or, or you would have to cut interest rates and you would have to get the bond market, the long-term interest rate, to believe that the inflation rate is going down, to believe that this stimulus of multiple rate cuts won't stimulate the economy and to bring interest rates down yet again. And that's a tough call because the Fed keeps talking about raising uh, cutting rates, excuse me. And I look in the uh, the high of the year in the 10 year yield was yesterday at 4.46 percent. Yeah. You know, so the bond market is not going in the direction that the Fed keeps hinting that it's going to go at. So it's going to be a tall order to bring those rates back down in order to give those companies that kind of um, relief for the moment. The stock market is kind of ignoring it, and it will for a while longer, too. But I like to joke that if you ultimately forever ignore the cost of money, there's two types of, of investors that ignore the cost of money for long periods of time. Those that have lost money and those that will lose money. <laughs> it will ultimately matter at some point if interest rates don't start down. I get it. It's not mattering yet. But if they keep going up, it will start to matter, and it might start to matter a lot sooner than people think. Well, if inflation's going up, interest rates have been going up. And again, mm -hmm. you could just look at a very basic example, which historically over the span of our career, which isn't the meme stock era or anything like that, or AI, you have, you know, Exxon's many times been, you know, the number one market cap in the world, or at least on the U.S. side. Now look at Exxon in the last three months against Apple. Everyone owns Apple, nobody owns Exxon. You know, I mean, I mean the, the meme crowd. And, and that's right. going to have to change. If you're not long of inflation from an investing perspective, you're getting smoked. Now, on that, because you speak a lot, I've read your notes on uh, where you're at on duration, and you're, I think you're neutral on, on, the, on the yield curve in terms of positioning, but uh, give us yeah. a review of that. Uh, but I just want to remind people that if you're long like TLT or you're long duration, because you don't understand, you believe the Fed on or Austin Goolsby, God, God forbid, on inflation, you're getting killed in the last three months on the fixed income side. Yes, you know, so duration for most that are now, you know, that's just I'll use the modified duration definition. If if interest rates move one percent from four point four to five point four, how much will the price percentage move be of the ten year price of the bond? And if you're short duration, that means that if you have a benchmark and we run an ETF and its symbol is WTBN for Wisdom Tree, that's our partner, the Bianco Total Return Fund, and it's a long fixed income uh, ETF. If you, um, we have a benchmark and we are running uh, our duration below that benchmark, meaning we are less sensitive to the movement of interest rates. So if interest rates move up, we don't get hurt as much. We're neutral on the yield curve. We're a little bit um, 
um, uh, underweight on corporates as relative to our benchmark because we've seen this big move in corporates and, and in the stock market, and we think that there's going to be um, a pullback, and we're long the dollar, betting that there will be some kind of dollar strength so far this year. That's been our positioning, in full disclosure. We have been doing better than our benchmark, and that's always our goal to do better than our benchmark, but it's down in the year because we're fully invested. We're ultimately trying to be a long only fixed income investor, and we're down on the year, but we're down less than our benchmark is. Yep. So when the market rebounds, we're closer to getting back to positive is the way that I would like to uh, say how that works. But yeah, that's how I'm positioned. And the reason I'm positioned that way is because I do think that inflation is going to stay sticky. The inflation beneficiaries like commodities, oil and everything else is been moving higher. Interest rates will respond by moving higher. Being short duration means I'm not going to take a loss. And you're right. TLT is a ETF that owns 20 years or longer treasury securities. That has very long duration. So when you look at its price movements, it's, you know, it's up 30 percent, down 30 percent. It yeah. makes huge moves on interest rates. And so you have to be careful about investing in something um, like that. And right now, TLT is kind of a benchmark for the bond market. Yep. Everybody likes to play it and they've been getting slaughtered in it this year. Well, I mean, if you're, I mean, a and, and nice job constructing that. I just punched it in for uh, relative performance. If you put in WTBN against TLT on, and again, it's as Mandelbrot, Benoit Mandelbrot would, would have taught anyone who paid attention, it's the particular thing that happens in the particular points in cycle time. And again, inflation, commodity cycles, global industrial production, everything bottoming on that front in the fourth quarter has been highly inflationary through the lens of the currency market, strong dollar, through the lens of rising bond yields to your point, 60 basis points on the 10-year yield in three months. And, and the relative setups on, on, on your strategy versus just being outright believing the Fed that we've you know, had the Hall of Fame year or whatever on inflation. So I, again, as a practical matter, it's one thing to, well, it's one thing for, to listen to Jim Bianco and I rant, which clearly we, we're, we would score at least a B plus on that. Uh, but it's another thing to make money on it, right? You're an institutional right. manager, you gotta figure it out. Right. You know, and, and this also brings up an, another point I think we, I, I will stress as to, you know, what we're talking about is why do we have so much inflation? Why is the uh -huh. economy not showing any signs of a soft landing or a recession? I think there's two things and they're kind of related. Um, during the period from 2010 to 2020, the savings rate in the United States was 6%. Now, let me define the savings rate. What your income is, that's your W-2 plus your investments and everything else, including transfer payments from the government, Social Security, disability or anything, less what you spend. You spent 94% of your paycheck. The savings rate averaged 6% from 2010 to 2020. Since 2022, the savings rate has been averaging 4%, two percentage points lower. What that means <coughs> is that consumption in the United States has gone from 67% of GDP to 69% of GDP. We're buying more things. We're buying more services. We just buy more stuff, buy more services. Now, why, are, why is the savings rate down? Well, there's no clear answer, but I think in looking at some of the data, that there, every recession and every financial crisis produces a change of behavior. And let me give a quick word. Change does not mean dystopian or worse. Mm -hmm. It means different. The, we had a downturn and people were afraid. And, what, and I'm talking about 2020 with the COVID shutdowns. And people were afraid. And then what happened? They went to the mailbox and the government sent them thousands of dollars and in stimulus checks. And so coming out of it, they said, I don't need emergency savings anymore because the next downturn, I'll go to the mailbox and there'll be another big check. So let's spend more money than we normally spend. And that's why the economy stays so hot, because we spend more. And people say, well, it can't last. You're right, it can't. It'll last, this entire cycle will be about more spending. Whenever we have another recession, whether it's later this year or in 10 years or whenever it is, then it'll change. But if the next recession, we mail them $10,000 instead of $3,000, the savings rate might go to zero coming out uh, com, coming out of that in addition to thus spending more money on a on a personal level the government is spending more money too we're running massive budget deficits look the government takes in taxes it spends money 
and it's spending more than it takes in taxes, borrowing the rest, equal to 6% of GDP. What is 6% of GDP historically? Where it spends when it's panicking we're in the middle of a recession to try and stimulate us out of a recession. That's what we're spending now in, this, in the fourth year of a recovery when, we're, when the economy is growing at its potential or more. You combine all that stuff and we're just spending money like crazy. And that's why we have inflation. And that's why the economy is staying strong. And that's why, given all that, when the Fed talks about, oh, we're going to give you cheaper money, 5,200 on the S&P is the next thing you look up and you see. Why wouldn't it be 5,200 on the S&P? Now, the only thing that stops that is if the market starts to think, whoa, 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 this is a a little bit too much here, and we're going to wind up with inflation, and we're going to wind up with problems in the economy. It's not there yet but higher interest rates could bring about it. But let me bring that back. What changed in 2020, and every recession changes something, is that we spend more money. Why are, why coming out of this one do we spend? Um, because we trained everybody that in a downturn, you will get big dollars in your mailbox from the federal <laughs> government. Oh, so okay. why have emergency savings? Let's go to Italy. Let's buy a new car or whatever it is that we desire. We desire. Yeah, on that, uh, guys, show slide 82, uh, it's, it's hard to conjure a positive out of this. This is what's happened to the, you know, Jim was talking about the 44% of people who can't come up with a dollar uh, by the end of the week. A thousand dollars. A thousand. A thousand. thousand. Uh, yeah. A thousand isn't what it used to be. Uh, b- b- bottom right. 50. A thousand dollars in an a thousand dollars in an emergency. They can't come up with it. Is what they're saying. It's brutal because of that mm-hmm. picture. The bottom 50% of households. That's what their assets have done on the left side, and that's what their revolving credit, their borrowings have done on the, on the right side. You know, it's, in, it's interesting that you bring that up because the other thing, and this has been true for 30 plus years, so it's not a new thing, but it never mattered until the inflationary period of the last couple of years, that the bottom 50% own 6, 6% of the assets in the United yeah. States. The top 10% own something like half the assets in the United States. But the bottom 50% have over half the debt. Yep. So the bottom 50% don't own assets and they have debt. The top 10% have very little debt, if no debt, and they own assets. Well, 2010 to 2020, when the inflation rate's one point something and interest rates are two point something, that mix of not having assets and cheap money in terms of borrowing can work for a while. Yeah, but in 2024, when you have inflation and the prospects of more inflation, booming markets that they don't participate with and high interest rates, that equation doesn't work. And that's why you're seeing the stress point from a political standpoint. Yeah, politically very good point. That's why in Fairfield County, uh, people really struggle, you know, very, very uh, left, you know, Democrat voting state, obviously. They struggle. Why? How could anyone intellectually ever vote for Trump? Well, we, we just showed you all the numbers on who would vote for Trump, people that don't have any money. They want something to change because they know that anything, any kind of a change could be, just so you're saying there's a chance. So I, I think that there's that. Unfortunately, we, we only have, have only time for one more question. And I want to just say, mm-hmm. like, okay, let's just say that everyone's right. Tr- let's try that, Jim. So let's okay. say Keith and Jim are right. Inflation's higher for longer. The people who think the Fed's going to cut two to three times are right because, to, 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 to your point, Jay said so. Okay, so we're going to have both. If you have both camps are right, and inflation does bust the move towards 4 or 5%, when do you think the first rate hike would be? Well, I think that the first rate hike would have to come soon because what I would suspect, if they do cut rates and we're in 3% and they stimulate and it starts moving up, you will have a bad reaction out of the bond market. Yeah. The first thing you'll see is you'll see probably at least 5% in the 10-year note. And by the way, I don't know if you saw um, this morning, um, Jamie Dimon is now talking about the 10-year note going to 8%. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so you could, and, and he's talking about it under these type of scenarios, right? That we overstimulate and get too much inflation. You would see interest rates start moving up. Harken back to what the stock market did in 2022 when interest rates were zooming higher. It fell 25% you would see the stock market start to fall quite a bit. And there would be enormous pressure on the Fed 
from the top half and especially the top 10 percent, Jay, make this stop, meaning make this decline in the stock market stop, make this sell off in the bond market stop and stop immediately. And the only way he could do that is by showing credibility on uh, in this inflation fight. Let me remind everybody something in 2022, the highest yield of the entire year was 4.2 percent in October of 22, 4.2. And that was the year we had 9% inflation. Last year, when the Fed stopped cutting rates, uh, stopped raising rates, we got over 5% by October. Why do we have a higher interest rate in 2023 when the inflation rate was having the Hall of Fame year that we did in 2022? Because when the Fed's cutting rates, or when the Fed, excuse me, hiking rates in 2022 at 75 basis points a meeting, hey, Jay's on the case. Even though inflation's high, he's really putting the wood to it. He's going to stop it from going up. I don't need to sell my bonds. In 2023, when he says, all right, we're done. We're done. We think inflation is going to come around. Bond investors look around and go, man, I don't know if I want to own these things. If he's not playing, if he's not, if he's not being the cop to stop inflation, I don't know if I want to traffic in this bond market neighborhood and maybe I ought to leave. And that's why you get 5% yields. So if he cuts rates in the face of higher inflation and it moves higher, Everybody's going to abandon the bond market neighborhood. Rates zoom up. The stock market won't like it. And he'll be under immediate pressure to reverse himself. And then when he reverses himself, he'll have to explain. And a year after the election, his chairmanship's up for renewal. Even if Biden were to win, his chairmanship's up for renewal. And we'll have to see. So we'll see, you know, if he actually pulls the trigger on it. Like I've said in the beginning, if he didn't say that I'm going to cut rates, give that calendar guidance. And if he just said, look, if the data weakens enough, we will cut rates. And then he could come out and say, look, it's not weakening yet. Well, I think we'd have a completely different view about the Fed than we have right now. It's because he fell into that trap that Yellen warned him about many years ago. Don't give calendar guidance because people think that's a certainty. That like I joked, I don't need a Bloomberg anymore. I don't need to analyze anything. He told me he's going to do it. Yeah. Case closed. Well, it ain't closed. And that's the problem that we're facing right now. You see how he did it? He's a pro. He just finished with what he started with. That, that, that's perfect, <laughs> man. And uh, a very much appreciated, candid discussion as, as you and I tend to have. So very much appreciated. I know the people appreciate it. And uh, ending with that, uh, we're going to have to say goodbye. But thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Enjoyed it. He's Jim Bianco. And uh, up next, if you want to get really fired up, I got Mark Cahodes.